Today we're looking at Psalms 108, 109, and 110. Let's begin reading together here in Psalm 108, and I'll read the, uh, the first six verses of Psalm 108, and we'll get into our study. Psalm 108, beginning at verse 1. This is a Psalm of David, and David writes, O God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise even with my glory. Awake, lute and harp, I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples, and I will sing praises to you among the nations, for your mercy is great above the heavens, and your truth reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and your glory above all the earth, that your beloved may be delivered. Save me with your right hand and hear me. And so, obviously, as we began, I mentioned to you this is a psalm of David, and it's a song of praise. It's a song of praise to the Lord because God has been merciful. It's a song of praise because of God's love and His protection. And it's a song of praise because God gives David victory. Not only David, of course, He gives to those who trust in the Lord victory also. And notice how he begins here in verse 1, how he says, O oh God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise even with my glory. Because God is all of those things, uh, David's heart is steadfast. David is committed. He's a man of no compromise. He's an individual who's going to hold firmly and fastly to the Lord no matter what. In an era of compromise, when many who claim to be Christians or people who are followers of Christ seem to find it easy to compromise, this is one of those verses that help us to, to be encouraged to be of steadfast love and of a steadfast heart. And that's what David was all about. He was saying, I'm not going to be moved by anything, and I will continually praise you. And my praise and my worship will include music. I'm going to rise up early in the morning, and I'm going to sing praises to you. That's what my life's going to consist of. It's going to be a worship song to you. So the first thing in the morning as I awaken, because I am remaining steadfast in you, Lord, because my heart is, is to be firm and I will not compromise, well, I'm going to set my affection on the right things from the very beginning of the day. And so as I awaken, I'll be singing to you. Now, David obviously was a musician. He wrote songs as well as playing uh, stringed instruments, the lute and the harp and all. And so he's basically saying, I'll use the talents that you gave to me to bring glory to you. In verses 3 and 4, he says, I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I'll sing praises to you among the nations. Not only is my praise going to be to you as I awaken and perhaps I find a quiet time just so that you and I get together, Lord, and I sing, but I'm going to also let people know how I feel about you. My steadfast heart is going to be demonstrated in uh, the marketplace. I, I'm not going to be one of these, these closet believers who, who when I'm with uh, other believers, it's, it's easy to, to name the name of God and, and to talk about prayer and how I believe in Him. But I'm also going to do that when I'm amongst those who may not believe that or, or even agree with that, Lord. I'm not going to be ashamed of you. I'm not going to be ashamed of being identified as one who worships you because you've shown me your mercy and, and you've shown me your love. And so I'm going to be singing about your merciful truth. I'm going to share about your faithfulness to me. And I'm not ashamed to be identified with you. The Apostle Paul made it very clear that he was not ashamed to be identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said to us, if a man is ashamed of me, then uh, I'll be ashamed of him. And so for me, it's been a very important thing to be very careful and not to be ashamed or to shrink back in my relationship with the Lord but to be as very open as I could. And, and that has been not only in this pulpit, but that was long before God even gave me a pulpit to occupy. It was when I was going to college and secular school, or it's when I was with my friends, or it was when I was uh, on the job site. Uh, it really didn't matter. The Lord had given to me this, this uh, knowledge that He wanted me to be open in my love for Him. And so I encourage you in the same way. And that's what David is doing here. David is simply saying, I love you, Lord, and I, and I praise you. I, I praise you because your mercy is great, he says in verse 4. It's, it's above the heavens. And I praise you because your truth reaches to the clouds. And therefore, verse 5, be exalted, O God, above the heavens and your glory above all the earth. Lord, I just thank you so very much. I thank you for all that you're doing and I love you, and I want your glory to be known. I want people to understand how great you are. Now, when he says in verse 6 that your beloved may be delivered, save with your right hand and hear me, uh, he's basically pointing out that there are enemies. 
There are enemies that have come against him. And so he's saying to the Lord, I'm asking that you would deliver me. He says in verse 7, God has spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and measure out the valley of Sakat. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the helmet for my head. Judah is my lawgiver. Moab is my wash pot. Over Edom, I will cast my shoe. Over Philistia, I will triumph. And Chino sure does stink. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's my note to myself. The earth is the Lord's. That's the point that he's making. He's mentioning all of these places, Shechem, Valley of Sukkot, Gilead, Manasseh, Ephraim, and Judah. All of that are, are territories that belong to the nation of Israel. And so he's speaking about God owning the earth. The earth is the Lord's. Every nation in it belongs to him. When he speaks of Moab and he says, Moab is my wash pot, it's another picture of Moab, this, uh, this nation that, that the Lord did not regard as being a slave washing his feet. When he speaks of Edom, it's going to be displaced, and he's saying, and I'm ruling over Philistia or where the Philistines are. So basically, he's simply saying, I'm God over the whole earth. Verse 10, who will bring me into the strong city? Who will lead me to Edom? Is it not you, O God, who cast us off, and you, O God, who did not go out with our armies? Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. Through God, we will do valiantly. For it is he who shall tread down our enemies. So apparently he had begun a battle, but soon discovered that the Lord wasn't there fighting for them. So he's remembering that it's the Lord who fights for us, and he's pointing out that in order for us to be victorious, we need the Lord to be on our side. Uh, Deuteronomy in chapter 20, verse 4 says, the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. We as believers have opportunities to make choices. Either we can choose to fight our own battles, and the Lord is a gentleman, if you will. He'll step back and allow us to do that if you'd like to. Either you fight your own battles or you realize that the battle is the Lord's and you yield that battle over to him. It's up to you. You can make your decisions. Now, as for me, I would just as soon ask God to fight on my side because nobody can defeat the Lord. And if he's on my side, th then I have a sure victory. Romans 8, 31 and 32 says this, uh, what, sh what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And so we trust in the Lord because it's the Lord who gives us the victory. Verse 12 says, give us help from trouble. Vain is the help of man. Lord, I'm going to trust in you in all things. And if we could only understand that and keep that in mind, we would know that through God we will do valiantly. It is he who shall tread down our enemies. Now we have Psalm 109. Again, this is a psalm of David. Do not keep silent, O God of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They have also surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. In return for my love, they are my accusers, but I give myself to prayer. Thus they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Set a wicked man over him, and let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he's judged, let him be found guilty, and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless, and his wife a widow. Let his children continually be vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also from their desolate places. Let the creditor seize all that he has. Let strangers plunder his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy to him, nor let there be any favor, uh, any to favor his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off, and in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. So this is one of those merciful psalms. <laughs> he, really, he really knows how to be mad. I mean, he's pretty angry here. Uh, we'll obviously look at this as closely as possible. Obviously, as we've begun to look at this in the first few verses, David is uh, praying that the Lord will take vengeance on his enemies. 
Uh, again, he knows that either he can uh, try to avenge himself or he can trust in the Lord to be the one who does that on his behalf. Uh, in Romans, in chapter 12, verse 19, the Bible says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. What David is saying is, I have been harmed, Lord, and rather than me going out after them, instead of me trying to get justice from them or, or to, to get back at them for what they've done to me, Lord, I want to do this. I want to leave them in your hands because I know you're the one who judges righteously. But at the same time, as we begin here in verse 1, he says to the Lord, Do not keep silent, O God of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the, uh, the mouth of the deceitful have opened up against me. God, you have been faithful to me in the past. And so I'm asking you now to deliver me from my enemies. When he says the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have opened up against me, there is hardly anything that hurts a person of integrity more than to have people lying about them. I guess every person in this room on one occasion or another has more than likely had somebody tell a lie about you, say that you had done something that you indeed had not done. Now, sometimes they were saying things that you had done and whatever you got, you basically deserved. But there have been times when you were not guilty of that whatsoever, but somebody was speaking about you and, uh, and it hurt. It especially hurts if you're a person of integrity. It especially hurts if you're a person who is attempting to become honest, if you're a person who wants to speak your heart and, and tell the truth and and, and to do it as uh, something that is uh, honorable to the Lord and honoring God. Uh, there are not a whole lot of people who, who start out with a desire to have integrity, but they get saved and, and they start saying, well, Lord, you know, at one time I lied plenty and I spoke of others uh, in a harmful way and, 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 and I'm sorry that I've done that and I want to have a different life. And so you set out on a quest to become an honest person. Before I was saved, when I was in my teens, one of the things that I did, and I did well, was I lied. I lied a lot. I used to make up stories just for the fun of it. And some of them were the most outlandish lies that you could imagine. And I would do it on purpose just because. And I got into this habit of lying for, for about a year where I would make up things just to watch my friends blow their minds over the things that I was saying. And they were the craziest things. I mean, I would make up the craziest lies that you could ever, ever tell, and yet I could say it with a straight face, and I knew just exactly how to use the words and string them along. And then, you know, and many times I didn't even tell them I was lying to them. I, I just let them believe the lie. And I did that for a long time. And there was another period of time when I was not only lying, but I was also stealing. Now, that ought to make you nervous about right now. I'm a preacher and receive offerings. But anyway, lying and stealing. And I did that for quite some time. As a matter of fact, that's how I got spending money sometimes, is just by basically going and stealing something and selling it. Then I got saved. And when I got saved, I began to pray at that time, God, help me to become honest. Help me to become real. Help me to be an authentic person. And so over the years, it's been 34 years now, over the years, my life is radically transformed because now I really do desire to speak the truth. I want to be a man of integrity, a man who was whole in every way. And so one of the things that over the years has been hurtful to me has been when people lie about me when people will say something of me that's simply not true. Now, a long time ago, I learned that you can't run around always defending yourself. You most certainly can't say, well, if you heard this, well, it's not true. So what you have to do is make a decision. Do you deal with every lie that is told about you, or do you leave it in the hands of the Lord and ask God to take care of it? And pretty much a long time ago, I learned to begin just letting the Lord take care of it. And you pray. And you say, Lord, there's nothing really that I can do right now. See, if I begin to defend myself in my defense, I give the appearance of guilt. If I begin to say I didn't do that, it gives people every reason to think that perhaps I have. So I'll just leave this in your hands, Lord, because I can't win this way. I'm not going to fight my own battle. And some of you understand what I mean, because words can be used. They can be used constructively, but they can also be used 
in a destructive fashion. Proverbs 12, 18 says, There is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. Proverbs 19, verse 5 says, A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who speaks lies will not escape. Now, David has enemies, and his enemies have spoken lies about him, and they have also been opposing him for no good reason. Now, the origin of their lies is in their hearts. They, they actually are harboring hatred towards him. He says to us um, in verse 2, The mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They have also surrounded me with words of hatred, fought against me without a cause. In return for my love, they are my accusers, but I give myself to prayer. So these people were at one time friends of David, but they've turned on him. And I want you to notice something. They've rewarded his good toward them and rewarded uh, his love with hatred. Now, when we looked at Psalm 55, verses 12 through 14, the psalmist said, It is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide from him. But it was you, a man my equal, my companion, my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked in the house of God in the throng. These aren't just strangers who are saying things. You know, occasionally it'll come to my ear that somebody I don't even know has said something unkind about me or somebody I love. Well, that's one thing. But if somebody that I know very well, somebody I have fellowship with, somebody that I love, has said something hurtful, well, of course, that hurts most. Now, what do you do? Well, I want you to notice what he did in verse 4. He said, in return for my love, they are my accusers, but I gave myself to prayer. Lord, I just lifted this up to you, and I began to ask you to respond. They have rewarded me evil for good, hatred for my love. And so here's my prayer, sweet prayer that it is. Set a wicked man over him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he's judged, let him be found guilty. Let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few. Let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless, his wife a widow. Let his children continually be vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also uh, from their desolate places. Let the creditor seize all that he has. Let strangers plunder his labor. Uh, let there be none to extend mercy to him, nor let there be any to favor his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off, and in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. So he has a very kind wish list for these people. Basically, he's praying that they will reap what they've been sowing. He's saying, may evil uh, be punished with evil in every way imaginable. Now, in verse 8, I want to just point that out briefly here. Let his days be few and let another take his office. You see that phrase, let another take his office? It's interesting because this is a scripture that is actually used in the New Testament book of Acts. Let another take his office is, is actually used uh, concerning the fact that uh, after Judas fell in his treacherous way, they needed to appoint uh, another to take his place. If you take notes, it's found in Acts chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. Uh, it says, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now, this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. It became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that the field is called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate, let none live in it, let another take his office. So this treacherous person who hated David without a cause is actually a type of Judas who hated the Lord Jesus Christ and ultimately had his office taken by another. In verse 14, continuing, let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord. In other words, may God have no mercy on him. And let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be continually before the Lord, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth, because he didn't remember to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man, that he might even slay the broken in heart. As he loved cursing, so let, him come, let it come to him. As he did not delight in blessing, so let it be far from him. As he clothed himself with the cursing as with his garment, 
So let it enter his body like water and like oil into his bones. Let it be to him like the garment which covers him and for a belt which he girds himself continually. Let this be the Lord's reward to my accusers and to those who speak evil against my person. And so don't let anybody in the entire family be let off the hook because of this. And even when they are no longer remembered by people, he's saying God never forget their sin. Now, the Bible tells us in Jeremiah 32, 18, that God shows loving kindness to thousands, and he repays the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. So he's basically saying, may you blot out their memory and not forget their sin. And may their children reap the consequences of what they have done. We were talking about this just the other day, how uh, very often in parenting, when you're bringing up your children, uh, you have options. You can bring them up in the ways of the Lord, and you can pray that God's blessing will go generationally from you to your kids, from your kids to their kids, and on and on and on. That's why it's so important for us as parents to do our very best to raise our kids to know the Lord. That's why it's important for us as parents to, uh, as they're young especially, to form in them uh, a knowledge of the Scriptures, to give to them a grid whereby they're able to take the things of the world and sift them through by God's Word. Because as they get up in the morning and as they leave for school, as they get to go to school and all through their, their all young uh, upbringing into high school, into college, whatever, you know, you may be raising them in one way in the house, but the minute they get into the classroom, it's a different thing entirely. Unless you have them in a Christian school that is going to support your morals, values, ethics, and teachings, they're going to go to a school that very often is filled with children who do not have the same upbringing that they have, and, and they're going to be hanging around kids who are going to be influencing them in ways that you have been trying to teach them not to be involved in. And unless you've given to them a moral grid through the Word of God, unless you've given them devotions in every day of their life, unless you present to them what the truth is, when the lie is presented, they're going to bite the lie because they're going to believe that it's truth. See, so one of the things that I tried to do, and I still do with my kids, is I tried to reason with them. When they were young, we would have devotions every day. When they were very small, from the time they were very, very small, from the time that they could sit there and begin to listen. When they were, you know, two years old, I used to have devotions with the kids every day, and we did it for years. It wasn't for a week or a month. It was for years, all their young life into high school. As they got into high school, you know, they had a lot of events, a lot of things that they were doing. It was difficult to do that, but we still had family night where I would have devotions with them. When they made choices that were wrong, they did that. They did that with full knowledge that it was wrong. When they did the things that were wrong, and of course, every one of my kids did something wrong. Sometimes they did things wrong all the time. They got that from their mom. But when that happened, when they would do these things, it was never, ever without knowledge of what the truth is. Because I would sit down with them. I would read them devotions. I would read them from the scriptures. I would have prayer with them. And, and mama would do that when daddy wasn't there. We did that so that we could give to them a moral grid so that they would know what truth is. Now, not everybody has that advantage. Not everybody does that. Sometimes when you send your kids to school with a kiss and a prayer, you're hoping that everything goes well for them that day. You ought to send them to school with the Word of God too, though. You ought to pray for them and give them a scripture in the morning and send them off with God's blessings. Not a good luck, hope you make it back in one piece, but of the prayer, you know, saying, God, in Jesus' name. I can tell you what I used to say. My kids could tell you this. When they would get off the car, I would, they, I would kiss them goodbye, and I would, I'd take them by the hand, and I'd say, Dear Jesus, in your name I pray that you will keep my son or keep my daughter today. In your name, may they remember who they belong to. May they remember who they belong to. May they remember that they belong to you, not that they're carrying my name or my reputation. May they remember that they are carrying your name and your reputation. And I prayed for them, and I still do the same way. Remember who you belong to. My kids can tell you that even when they're walking out. There are times even now, my oldest is 27, my youngest is 21, my son David's 26, and my Joseph's 23. And they'll be walking out, and I'll turn to them, and I'll say, don't forget who you belong to. Don't forget, because they belong to the Lord, and they need to know that. So when they make choices that are wrong... They do that against the will of God, and they know that clearly, you see. And so you can be a blessing to your kids by training them in the ways of the Lord. 
You can be a blessing to your kids by encouraging them in the Word and, and, and sharing the Bible with them over supper or over breakfast or whenever you can. By having a night that you get together, even if it's for a half hour, and you sit them down in the front room and you say, we're going to read the Bible and I'm just going to read a few verses and we're going to pray and we're going to ask God just to honor His Word in this family. And if you do that and continue to do that, they're going to have that moral grid. So when somebody says they ought to do this or that, they're going to say, but that's not what my dad taught me to do. That's not what my mom says is right. That's not what the Bible says. Now, some don't have that in their life. And so they give nothing to their kids that is going to help their kids. And ultimately, the sins of the father become the normal way the house is. The sins of the mother just becomes the way that we live here in this house. And so it's okay to get into porn because my dad has magazines. It's okay for us to, you know, to do certain things because my mom does these things, and that becomes the normal way of life. So we can make choices. And so he's saying here, I would like you to remember their sin. I would like you to remember that the fathers gave those sins to the sons, and may they all be dealt with, Lord, in a, in a very fair way. Let the iniquity, he says in verse 14, of the fathers be remembered before the Lord. Let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be continually before the Lord, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth, because he did not remember to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man, that he might even slay the broken in heart. Verse 17, as he loved cursing, so let it come to him. As he did not delight in blessing, so let it be far from him. As he clothed himself with cursing as with a garment, so let it enter his body like water and like oil into his bones. And let it be to him like the garment which covers him and for a belt with, with which he girds himself continually. Uh, let this be the Lord's reward to my accusers and to those who speak evil against my person. And so basically he's saying, may they reap what they've been sowing. Inasmuch as the wicked do not value love and friendship, may they reap what they have sown. Now, verse 20 is interesting how he puts it. Let this be the Lord's reward to my accusers and to those who speak evil against my person. It reminds me of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. It's an interesting scripture there. The apostle Paul is writing, and it just basically comes out of nowhere. He says this. Paul says, Alexander, the coppersmith, has done me much harm. And then Paul says, may the Lord reward him according to his works. Now, that's an interesting thing. Instead of saying, may God be merciful to Alexander, he says, may the Lord reward him according to his works. May he reap what he has sown. And that's what David is saying here. Let this be the Lord's reward to my accusers and to, to those who speak evil against my person. Verse 21, but you, O God, o God the Lord, deal with me for your name's sake. Because your mercy is good, deliver me, for I am poor and needy. My heart is wounded within me. I am gone like a shadow when it lengthens. I am shaken off like a locust. My knees are weak through fasting, and my flesh is feeble from lack of fatness. I also have become a reproach to them. When they look at me, they shake their heads. In contrast to the wicked, God be loving and merciful to me. Revive me, Lord, and work within me. That's what he's saying in verse 21 when he says, You, O God, the Lord, deal with me for your name's sake, because your mercy is good. Deliver me. He goes on to say, My heart is pierced. That's what he means in verse 22 when he says, I'm poor and needy and my heart is wounded. My heart is pierced with sorrow. My life feels like it's slowly ebbing away, like a shadow. I'm losing weight and my strength uh, through this time of pain. Now, one of the things about that, by the way, is when you get to the point of losing strength and, and losing all of that, that's one of those places I've discovered myself sometimes to be in when I call out to the Lord and I say, God, uh, your word tells me in my weakness, then I can be made strong. Because, Lord, at this point, I cannot hope in anything other than you. So it's not always a bad place to be as you begin to cry out and say, God, I need your help. In verse 26, help me, O Lord my God, save me according to your mercy, that, you, that they may know that this is your hand, that you, Lord, have done it. Let them curse, but you bless. When they arise, let them be ashamed, but let your servant rejoice. Let my accusers be clothed with shame, and let them cover themselves with their own disgrace as with a mantle. 
I will greatly praise the Lord with my mouth. Yes, I will praise him among the multitude, for he shall stand at the right hand of the poor to save him from those who condemn him. And so finally he says, may they see your hand of mercy on me and know that it is you who delivers. May they also experience your judgment and know that it is you who is dealing with them. I will confidently wait on you, Lord, though, because I know that you are going to move on my behalf. And the reason I know that is simple. It's because you deliver those who trust in you. Psalm 72, verses 12 and 13 says, He will deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also, and him who has no helper. He will spare the poor and the needy and will save the souls of the needy. And so, again, it's a good place for you when you finally realize that you're in a place where you can't deliver yourself. Some of us get upset about that. We even blame the Lord for that. But I've discovered and am discovering almost on a daily basis that in that particular position that I find myself in sometimes, it's a good place to be. Because I'm getting to the point now as I'm growing older in the Lord to realize that all things really do work out for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Everything works out in time. Sometimes we think it's not working out simply because we don't see God's timetable. We don't realize what the Lord is planning on doing. We don't know how God is going to work. We really need to learn to understand that. We need to give God time to work in our lives. Sometimes we think if he doesn't move right now, it's just not going to, nothing good is going to happen. But I've discovered that if I just trust in the Lord and wait on him and remain steadfast, that the Lord has a way of delivering me in his time. And he's never been late. He's always on time. He always does it in the right moment, in the right way. If we could understand that, we end up praising him. And finally, Psalm 110. This is a small psalm. It only has 127 verses. No, I lie. I told you that earlier. I'm a liar. Anyway, Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. Now, as we look at this particular psalm, it speaks prophetically of David's descendant. And we're going to see this. I'm going to take a moment to look at this with you because I want you to see this. Uh, he speaks prophetically of David's descendant who is actually the Lord. In, in reality, Psalm 110 is what is called a messianic psalm because it points to Jesus Christ. And we'll see that in just a moment. But this particular psalm is either quoted or alluded to in various books in the New Testament. It's quoted in Matthew as well as the Gospel of Mark and Luke. It's quoted in the book of Acts as well as 1 Corinthians. It's quoted in Colossians as well as the book of Hebrews. And so this psalm here is very definitely messianic. As a matter of fact, as we look at this, notice how it begins. In verse 1, it simply says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now, in context, David is referring to God's promise of a uh, continual dynasty. The promise that God gave to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 was a promise that he would always have someone to be on the throne. In 2 Samuel 7, 16, he said, Your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. So the promise God gave to David actually gave to David authority. And that authority that he had was to be used under God in order to establish the people of Israel. But under David's rulership, Israel had what is called a theocracy, God ruling through the king that he had appointed. This particular scripture, though, verse 1, is actually fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus even quoted this promise when he was debating with some Pharisees. Now, recently when we were in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 12, I pointed that out to you, but let me refresh your memory. It's found in Mark chapter 12, verses 35 through 37. 
In that passage of Scripture, Jesus was answering, and he said, while he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. And so this was a scripture that is fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. David, the king of Israel, is recognizing that there's someone greater than he, even though he's the recipient of the promise to have a, an heir on the throne continually. So when David is speaking here, when it says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool, it's a prophecy related to Messiah. In verse 2, it says, the Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. So God will cause even his enemies to recognize the authority of Jesus Christ. In Psalm 132, 18, his enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself his crown shall flourish. And so he's pointing out that the ruler is going to have rule over those, even those who at one time did not want to follow him. Now, verse 3 and 4 is interesting. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, notice when he says, your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. Your armies are made up of willing volunteers who are willing to follow you into battle. These volunteers are fully consecrated to you because they love you. Now, the, the verse 3, your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power, gives to me a tremendous encouragement, especially as a Christian, because if there's anything that is powerful, it's a volunteer. You know, when I was in the military, I spent time in the Army. I was drafted. I was, uh, you know, I received my draft notice. I, was re I had to report for duty and all of that. I was drafted. But, and I've told you this story. I won't bore you with a whole lot of details. I went in on August 25th, 1970. When I went into the induction center, I was not a Christian yet. I went into the induction center there in Los Angeles, and because when I was 18, I had taken a tire iron and broken a window at a jeweler, uh, a jewelry shop, and I had stolen $2,000 with the diamond rings, uh, I had been arrested, and they knew that was on my record. And so when I was standing before the guy who was, uh, was going to bring us into the military, he said, we reviewed your, your record. You were arrested. We're going to have to review it further. Now you have an option. Either you can come in today or we'll send you a second notice and give you another day. And so I went home. I didn't want to go in that day. That was August 25th. And I've told you this before. One of my friends had read something in a magazine that stated that you could continually um, get a new date of induction if you just become a pen pal with Uncle Sam. And so I received in September a notice to go in. You are hereby ordered to report for duty on September 20th. And I wrote them a letter, and I wrote back, and I said to them, I'm sorry, I have to go to the doctors. And so they sent me a letter in October. You are hereby ordered to report for active duty October 12th. And I wrote them a letter. Sorry, I got to go to court. Then they wrote me a letter in November, and I wrote them back. And I had a pen pal relationship going with my Uncle Sam. Just kept writing, he kept writing, and I kept writing. And I did that for months. Then I got saved. When I got saved, I thought, oh, man, and I ultimately... What I did is I volunteered for the draft. The reason I did that is I was watching, you know, a movie of all things. I was praying, God, I don't want to go into the military. I'm freshly saved. I want to go to church. I want to grow, but I have to go. What am I supposed to do? Am I a conscientious objector or not? And I'm watching, you know, Sergeant York, this old movie, and he had the same dilemma, and, and he goes off into the mountain, and he's reading, and it says, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, and to God the things that belong to God. And, and he went into the military, and I thought, well, you know, if it was good enough for Sergeant York, it's good enough for me. And so I volunteered for the draft. And even though I was drafted, you can still volunteer for the draft. This is what I did. So I signed up to go in March 15th, 1971, and I went in. At that time, they started what they called VOLAR, Voluntary Army. And so there were a lot of people going in at that time. They ceased the draft and began voluntary. 
Now, when you're drafted, like I was initially, you don't want to go. When you're drafted, I don't care how patriotic everybody else is, you're thinking, man, there goes my life. I don't want to go. But there is a difference. There's a difference between those who are volunteers and those who are drafted. Now, some of the drafted guys were very patriotic and all, but the volunteers were even more so because the volunteers did not have to go in. And when you've got a strong military that is based on volunteerism, there's hardly anything stronger than a volunteer. And that's the truth, and you see that in the military. That's why you'll hear military experts speak about that. And they'll say, we may have a, a military that's built on volunteerism, but there's nothing stronger than a volunteer because they chose to go, because they made a decision to go. They knew the cost. They, they weighed it out. They made the decision. They went in. That's true in the military. It's also true in the Lord's army. There's nothing stronger than people who are in love with the Lord and want to serve Him. There's nothing stronger than somebody who gets down on their knees and says, God, here am I. I want to be used by you. Like Isaiah, when he has a, a vision of the holiness of the Lord, and as he sees the Lord's vision of beauty and perfection, and, and he realizes first and foremost that he's a man of unclean lips, and he says, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, but he says that one of the, the angels took a burning coal from the altar, placed it on his lips, and cleansed him, and then the question comes out, it rings from the throne of heaven, who will go for us? Who will I send? And at that point, you see Isaiah saying, here am I, Lord, send me. I want to be used by you. I'm not reluctant at all. I have been purged, and I am ready, and I want to be used by you. All you need to do in the morning is wake up and say, Lord, you're sending me into a mission field. Now, to be honest with you, Lord, you know that I've been complaining about the place that you're sending me. I don't necessarily like this job. But, Lord, I want to look at it as a ministry now and not a burden. I want to see you use me where I'm at. I want to be used as a light in a dark place. God, I study your word, and you say that you're giving to me opportunities, and I want to trust you. I want you to manifest yourself to me. I want to open my mouth so you can fill it. I want to be a man or a woman who is used by you wherever I am. I want to be a volunteer in your army. And when you have that kind of heart, God will use you. Look around. And you will see that some of the ministries that you know well through the radio or perhaps you used to attend or still do, you will discover that what makes the ministry a powerful ministry is the individuals who are there serving are doing that because they love the Lord. They do that because Jesus Christ means everything to them, not for some title and not for a salary. They do that because they're in love with Jesus Christ, because they can do nothing but serve Him, and they look for opportunities to do that. In 2 Corinthians 5.14, Paul said it this way. He said, the love of Christ constrains me. From the inside, it forces me to be used by God. There was a time when Jeremiah, the Old Testament prophet, had made a determination. He'd been going through some pretty rough things. So he says, I made a determination that I would speak no longer in, in his name. But he says, but your word was in me like a fire. It was raging within me, and I had to speak. I had to speak. Because, Lord, you put something in me that needs to come out. Listen, there's no secret to a successful Christian life, guys. There's no secret to it. Just fall in love with the Lord. There's nothing, there's no secret to that. Just fall in love with Jesus Christ. Because when you fall in love with the Lord, you're going to be willing to go anywhere he says, do anything he says, because you're in love with him. It doesn't really matter. You see, when my wife Marie married me, Marie was born and raised here in Chino. And for her, it was a long-distance drive to Norwalk, where I, where I lived. But you know, when she, when she married me, she didn't say, you know what, you're going to stay here in Chino or I'm not going to marry you. She said, wherever you go, I will go. And so wherever the Lord led her husband, that's where the wife went. It just so happens that the Lord brought me back here to her joy and my great sorrow. But he did. <laughs> he brought us over here. And you know, the Lord, uh, you know, he just does that. And so she made a decision, wherever my husband is, that's where I'm going to go. That's how it is. 
Well, I made the same kind of decision when I gave my heart to the Lord. And I gave to God a contract. And the contract that I gave to him had my signature on the bottom and was totally blank. And I said, you fill in what you want. You fill in the details. I'm signing an agreement. Whatever you want for me, I will do. Wherever you want me to go, I will go. When you want me to speak, I will speak. Whatever it is you want, I will do. Because, Lord, I'm in love with you. And when you have a love for the Lord, you will do whatever God wants. And you want to know something, by the way? Sometimes you say, man, if I do that, wow, what if he sends me someplace I don't want to go to? He does. He does. But you want to know something? The place that you don't want to go to is the best place for you. And you will rejoice because you're there. You'll rejoice because you're in the center of the will of God. You will rejoice and not only rejoice, but you will grow to love the place that you are because that's where he is meeting you in the most special place, in the best way, in the deepest way. And so the Lord speaks to our hearts, and your people are volunteers in the day of your power. Your army marches and will go wherever you want and do whatever you want because we're in love with you. We will follow you to the ends of the earth. Now, he says in verse, uh, in verse uh, 3, continuing, he says, Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power and the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. You have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn, will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. That's interesting. Melchizedek is the individual who met Abram when Abraham was returning from the slaughter of the kings that you find in the book of Genesis where he had gone after some kings who had taken his nephew Lot captive. You know the story. I don't have to go into great detail. But he was met by an individual by the name of Melchizedek, one of the more mysterious people you find in Scripture. He's mentioned in, 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 uh, in Genesis. He's mentioned also in the Psalms here, and he's mentioned in the book of Hebrews several times. Now, in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, the writer of Hebrews says this about Melchizedek. He said, This Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, being first translated king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. So in verse 4 here in Psalm 110, when it says, The Lord has sworn, will not relent, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ is not from the tribe of Levi, he's from the tribe of Judah. And the thing that he's pointing out is that Jesus' priesthood actually predates the 12 tribes because Melchizedek met Abraham before the 12 tribes had come into existence. And Melchizedek, who is the king of righteousness, that's what the word Melchizedek means, king of righteousness, as well as king of Salem. The word Salem is, an, is also shalom, king of peace. Melchizedek is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the picture that we have here in Psalm 110, verse 4, that Jesus has an order that is not of the Levitical but predates it. In verse 5, he says, The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. He's simply saying when the king goes out to war, he is certain of victory and crushes all who oppose him. Now, this obviously occurs not just in the life of earthly kings, but this is to be fulfilled in the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll be looking at that in detail this upcoming Sunday, so I won't give you an awful lot of information other than the fact that this will take place when the Lord returns. Again, I mentioned to you Psalm 110 is a messianic psalm that finds its fulfillment in the ministry of Jesus. In the Old Testament book of Nahum, an Old Testament prophet, it says in chapter 1, verse 2, God is jealous, the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. When the Lord Jesus Christ returns, he's going to be doing exactly that, taking vengeance and bringing wrath. Now, for us, it isn't against us because we're part of his forces. We're on his side. But those who have opposed him are going to be met with his wrath. 
That's why in Luke chapter 19, verse 27, Jesus says, bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, slay them before me. Very often we have this picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, meek and mild, but we fail to realize that not only is he the Lamb of God, he is also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Not only did he come and bring peace, but in his second coming, he comes and brings judgment. And as he brings judgment, it's against those who've rejected him. Psalm 110 speaks concerning that and is fulfilled when the Lord Jesus Christ returns.